um, just all the information that they've already shared. And so they mentioned this GPGI acronym. And in the government, we're really guilty about coming up with those, right? But it really is. So it's, it's this Great Plains Grassland Initiative. That's that full name. And so obviously GPGI is short for that. But just really kind of <clears throat> want to just give a quick background. So I know we're running a little short on time, so I'm supposed to, supposed to get her done pretty darn quick. What we realize, one of the things that's really exciting in range management right now is we actually are starting to have some technology that really starts letting us know some things spatially across the landscape, but also through time. And so if you haven't heard about the rangeland analysis platform, I'd encourage you to look into some of that. And that's where some of these maps can be found. And so, you know, I've worked with ranchers for a lot of years. I know how hard all of you work to make the landscape what it is. And the grasslands just in our state are so valuable. And I know that it takes a lot of hard work at a local level to make that happen. And so from my standpoint, I appreciate that. At the same time, when we started looking at this data, it's like, doggone it, something's going on. And we feel it at a local pulse, but it just seemed like these maps really started showing that out. And so on this particular instance, green is open grassland, expansive grassland, minimal tree cover. What that rangeland analysis platform can do is start breaking those out. It can tell perennial grass and forb, annual grass forb, shrubs and trees. What you'll see on here then is actually the red, that's more like forest. 1990, 2020. And so that's one of those things that's kind of a, oh wow. If that doesn't make you step back and go start going, well now what's going on? And, and, and that's one of the things that really hit us hard from a standpoint of, because I know every one of you has been trying to cut trees, keep the prairie open, those things. It, it hasn't happened without some work. And so then I started asking, so what are we doing? And or can we ask some better questions? What's going on out there? So one of the things we had an opportunity to is we have actually a, a working lands for wildlife team that started looking at some of this data. Starting to put some pieces together going, you know, what's, what are we doing wrong if we are? Or maybe is there a better opportunity? And that's what I want to think about is, is there maybe a little bit better opportunity to approach this particular situation? Too many times we're pretty guilty of, and even in our own agency probably have, have done this, is let's, let's, you know, we can help you once there's already a problem. And so like in medical, they really give this, this kind of diagram here, and I can appreciate it. So many times we'd send in the ambulances. So in other words, the trees are already there. They've already got a foothold. Let's go recover it. And we're struggling and struggling with that rather than stepping back and go, is there a way to better prevent? How do we prevent this from starting? So can we, can we focus some efforts there? And yeah, we'll push out from there, but we've got to secure an area to be able to do that, to push out and really recover things. So that's kind of where the larger vision came into play is how can we, how can we look at this a little bit different? Go the right way here. And so what is this Great Plains Grassland Initiative? Well, two main things threaten our prairie at large scales, and that's woody encroachment and conversion. Those are our two major players as far as really causing the loss of grasslands, not only in Kansas, but across the Great Plains. And that's the area that we're really looking at from this standpoint. But it's this vision of what they call intact cores. So instead of just going over and sending ambulances to the edges, is how do we look at some of these core areas and let's secure them? Are there any kind of things that threaten them, or is there just little chips in that resiliency within those cores? And can we do something about that? And this is one of those opportunities that really kind of highlighted. So from that standpoint, what we really like to talk about is that it really stands on three pillars. One of the main ones is rancher driven. And fortunately, is we've got actually a producer kind of board that we actually try to consult with, get information back on. But what are they seeing at that local level? What's that, low, you know, that, that pulse at that local level? And what's their vision for this landscape? Because if it doesn't align, Daniel did a great job of that, is we might have the order a little bit different, but if we can share that common vision, we can find some success and success at large scales. And so that's what it is, that rancher driven side of it. Science, some of this information, this range and analysis platform, the woody encroachment guide you have out there, a lot of fantastic information in that one as well, but bringing that science along that gives us a better opportunity to really be strategic. What do we need to do? What do we need to accomplish? And then finally, from our standpoint, is how can we support that? How can we walk alongside? We're all sharing that vision. Let's work together to get on that landscape scale. The big thing then is that idea that how can we defend them and then grow them? And so that's kind of that approach that we're going to try to utilize and stepping alongside that. And the final standpoint then is what we didn't recognize on a landscape was that they're vulnerable. And so we'll show a couple of pictures. We actually got a specific example from the mesh rushes that they said I could share. We'll take a look at that, but we've got to recognize where we have vulnerable rangelands. 
And I think sometimes we drive right by them and we don't see it. And so that's what I really hope, if nothing else you take home, is you're probably going to take a little bit different vision on maybe some of that vulnerability in our landscape. And of course, that final thing is how do we really combat that? How do we actually get it? Because what encroachment's winning? Based on all the data, it's winning. And so we've got to find a strategy that can work if we're going to actually keep any of this grass land open. The guide. I'm not going to jump into too many details on this particular one, but there's some diagrams inside there. That's where a lot of this information came from. The one that was really highlighting to me was this idea of how do we recognize vulnerability on a landscape? And what drives that? And it starts with risk, this idea of sensitivity and exposure. That was one of those things where, because Flint Hills burn, don't they? We really, so sensitive wise, we use fire on a landscape. Uh, definitely what this data shows is if we didn't use fire, we'd already lost it. And so it shows the importance of that. We've got to make sure that we actually use fire as an ecological driver in this system. The other side of it though is how about our plant communities? Are they resilient? Do they, are they healthy? Are we using the grazing management? Are we keeping those healthy because a little glitch in the armor and they're going to take in there? Drought's another one. That's a tough one. That can increase sensitivity. If we don't have the biomass, we have a little weak spot, all it needs is that opportunity. What we didn't recognize was the exposure side of that equation, I think, is where's the seed sources at? And so anybody know how many seeds are in a hedge apple? 250 to 300 seeds in one hedge apple. And I saw a lot of them last fall. So all of a sudden I started looking at that. A cedar tree, about a million and a half seeds per mature cedar tree. And so we kind of learned some of those things. There's some videos, and they, they had me talk a little bit on, a, on Kansas Grazing Lands Coalition. It gets a little bit more into that detail. You can look at those. But we just didn't recognize that exposure. So we can do our best efforts, and boom, but all it takes is that one little opportunity. Maybe it's that drought. Maybe that grazing got a little heavy. Something opened the window. But if the seed's not there, what's the, you know, we're not giving it the opportunity. And so that's where it's stepping back and going, where's some seed located on this landscape? that maybe we can take that off of there one is reduced because I know the final part of this vulnerability equation is this adaptive capacity. And that's you all. Because I know you're out there spot treating. When it shows up, you're trying to get after it. But you're spending a lot of time at it, right? Over and over, it just keeps showing up. Well, why? Because that seed source is on the landscape. It takes those opportunities. We keep going after it. Let's maybe think about doing that better. Because what I'd like to do is have you do less of that. But you can manage You've got plenty of things to do. Daniel mentioned it. The family mentioned it. Time. So can we actually reduce this maintenance on landscape scales and across scales that matter to everybody, neighbors and all? So that's kind of the exciting part of all this. So here's the, here's the idea of we are hoping to stand out here and actually look at this beautiful landscape. And it is. Honestly, a few years ago, I'd look at that, wow, and go on down the line. You pull up Google, search Flint Hills, you'll have all kinds of sites like this, okay? But you start looking a little closer, and I apologize for not the highest quality, but there are a little bit of some dark green dots out there that are those trees. And so we would look at those and like, well, yeah, there's some out there, but oh, there's a few little red, if you can see it, I hope, but a couple of little red dots here, maybe a few small sprouts in the draw. You know, we're doing a good job. We're keeping up with that, okay? From a standpoint of looking overhead and down, yeah, most of it's, if you, I'm kind of in this example, that dark green, that's kind of that core grassland. You know, that's wide open, not at risk. That's what we're really looking at there. And so, we're, you know, there's a couple slivers here, a couple dots there. Don't see a lot of risk in that particular setting. What we started looking at with the better kind of the science is, hey, what about the maturity of that tree? Is it a seed producer? We're at on the landscape, and not it's not a tree, no tree, but it's a tree with a zone of influence. It started really highlighting some things. And so looking at that same landscape, is this is the reality. That's what your grassland feels. So it's not just tree, no tree, it's now all of a sudden we have a lot of seed across that landscape, and all of a sudden that idea of all this wide open, dark green areas, this is what their landscape looks like to the mushroom family. And that's one of those that they saw from a standpoint, and I remember Daniel saying, he says, that's one of my cleanest pastures. And that's the amount of risk that they are fighting, and, it's, and like I said, it's just, we keep spending more time, more dollars, why are we not getting ahead of this thing? And so these are some of the things that we're actually trying to help producers do is let's look at this landscape a little bit different. Can we reduce risk? And even if it's not rid of all of it, can we just, you know, if we strategically remove some of those seed producers, we can start getting that further distance. What if that nearest seed source is five miles away? Awesome. That would be fantastic. Just thinking about the pressure we could take off this Great Plains grassland landscape if we could do some of those things. 
So that's really what the overall Great Plains Grassland Initiative is. It isn't a financial program. Do we have financial dollars we like to help with? Yes. But it's this bigger vision across the Great Plains is how do we help our grasslands win? And so Daniel mentioned, how do we go a win-win is let's let them win. And we can actually still, and it doesn't matter what ecosystem service, if I'm livestock production, if I'm wildlife, if our grasslands aren't there, we can't talk about any of them. So that's really that kind of big key with all of this. So like I said, that's how we used to see the landscape. That's how we see it now. And I think that's why we start seeing that movement of woody encroachment across this landscape at a pace a lot quicker than maybe we saw in the past. Finally then, <clears throat> was from a Kansas standpoint, we have a few priority areas where we have that. We have some intactness that we'd like to secure. From that standpoint, start expanding. And so this is one of those things that we're working with. Our field offices have done tremendous work uh, in these three different kind of key grassland areas where we're starting, but we're trying to align that. Is where do we have these opportunities to win? Where do we have some strongholds of intact grassland? Where there's some wildlife? Where producers see that vision and want to go there? And how do we start working together on that? And finally, what's the reality on the landscape? So we finally, so working through this process of looking at it, if I have a mature tree, that's an encroachment area, okay? If I have that encroachment area, it has that zone of influence, we call that sort of that dispersal zone. So where can that seed go? Typically, that's around 200 yards away from trees, kind of as from a set standpoint. We've seen it move further, but that's just kind of a standard look at that. Our, in, our field offices, along with producers stepped up going, we want to do something different. They allowed us to come out, take a look at the landscape. In the last two years, they've inventoried around 176,000 acres, and this is what our key grassland areas in our state look like right now. 36% would be considered intact. In other words, they're not feeling the pressure of the, of the seed source, okay? 43, 44% is feeling seed pressure, okay? But it's only coming from what? Maybe about 14% of the landscape. And so what's, that's some of the things hopefully we can do is how about let's get after that 14% that's throwing that seed out across the landscape and start building this intactness. Let's get that over 50%. But again, these are some of these most open and intact grasslands, but that's the real reality on that local scale. So that's what we're learning more about all the time. What I wanted to bring some awareness to, probably a thousand questions. Um, if there are, that's fantastic. A lot of information about looking at the landscape different is actually in this guide that we handed out. What you can take home today, this is right out of the guide. I can't remember what page number it is, but Anytime we can maximize distance from any seed source to that intact grassland, let's take that opportunity. If nothing else, look at your landscape. Where are those risks at? Where might you have some of those? Add that, you know, because I'm guilty of it too. Drive through the pasture. I grew up on a small cow-calf ranch, you know, there, and drive by that. I'll get it next time. Next time, 10 years. Again, a lot of these trees, 6 to 10 years old, they'll start producing seed. So they're, they're just slow enough that we kind of, Drive by them a few times, and then all of a sudden we don't realize it, and then all of a sudden the pressure's on, and that's one more acre that's now been exposed just because we paused a little bit. So try to do that. Obviously, in this culture, fire's huge. If you're from a different part of the state where fire isn't used, that's a big one. To mitigate that, if fire's not on the landscape, very difficult to try to keep this grassland open. And then obviously the one big thing here, too, is property. we got to start seeing across fence lines. Bigger. We can't manage our pastures anymore. We need to manage prairies. And that's across. That's across landscapes. So just kind of taking some of those key things home and wanted to share that today with you. So appreciate the opportunity just real briefly to cover that. So perfect. Okay. So thanks all. Appreciate that.